okay, well, what if we start tilting the camera down and putting put, putting you in the general's the general's eyes uh, and having a rolling landscape? And because of those 3D cards, a rolling landscape was suddenly a thing that you could do, whereas before everything was square angles and corners. And out of that, uh, and a few experiments with flocking, um, um, we ended up with with this this. A medieval battlefield with lots and lots of little guys and, 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 a, and a general's viewpoint. And that started to evolve into, into Shogun Total War. In the year 2000, Shogun Total War released to the world. Nobody else had seen anything quite like it before. During development, Creative Assembly worked out how to make grid-based battles into something a bit more freeing. Open landscapes with hundreds of tiny men running across and they instantly knew they were onto something special. But the game and just its battles alone wasn't enough to really fill out what they wanted to do. The content wasn't enticing enough for an entire title on its own, and there was all these armies and generals that they wanted to flesh out a little bit more. So came the campaign, originally starting as an afterthought from the original battles, but becoming the majority of what Total War players now spend their time in. The setting itself was just chosen for ease of use. Shogun now is seen as the pitch for Total War, where it all started and spawned an incredible sequel with in-depth worlds showing these warring factions, but originally it was fairly simplistic. Having a less variety of troops with most factions using similar infantry, archers and cavalry, using less models, solidifying itself to be an easier setting to choose, now becoming almost legendary. But the development team was pretty small at this time. Creative Assembly in general were focused on other titles and this new idea of Total War was almost seen as a side project. Originally Shogun 1 only had about 15 people on the development team, which is crazy now looking back at it, seeing the behemoth that the franchise has now become. But it was never an accident. Shogun was never going to be an accidental success. They knew from the get-go they were onto something incredibly special. Being funded by their sports games in partnership with EA, Creative Assembly could spend all the time they wanted perfecting this, making one of the first 3D strategy games ever made. The game in itself sold over a million units, and for a first title in a franchise, it blew every expectation out of the water. So they knew they had to do something even bigger next. While Shogun's campaign focused more on segments and regions, they wanted to open it up a bit more. Whilst Medieval Total War was in the works, they had another title, in tandem, both being worked on at the same time, and without knowing, this would be the one that would take Total War to another level. This was Rome, overhauling the campaign to an open movement of all troops and diplomats, spies and faction leaders, adding in complete traits to everybody that could be gained over time, whether they're positive or negative, and directly affecting the way cities are managed. Auto resolves are calculated within the campaign, or the battles themselves, even down to just the speeches at the start of each fight. Men! The battle is inevitable! But victory hangs in the balance! Do your duty as true Romans and victory will be within our grasp! But they had one problem. They wanted the entire game to be full 3D. Not like Shogun where it almost teased it and went half the way, but wanted everything. Hundreds if not thousands of troops on the battle at the same time displayed in great detail, where players could sweep in with the camera at any situation to get a closer look in order to decide their orders. But there were no engines like this. There was almost no references. Nobody had done anything like Rome Total War in the past. Rome's art style was done in such a way that it didn't go for elite realism, but more of a cartoony texture. It fit in well at the time, and because of it, it even holds up to this day. Even the remaster that came out last year, I think doesn't even look as good as the original Rome 1. That title has held up more than anything, down to small specific details of how you get to know your leaders and their personalities, the way factions go to war with each other, and whilst the campaign AI leaves something to be desired and has definitely improved over the years in total war, things like battle terrain systems, being able to have authentic recreations of the sieges and battle maps that relate directly to the campaign map itself, 
armies being in the correct positions, naval vessels being seen off to the side, or the way that cities change on the campaign map being reflected within battles. This was never done in the way that Rome 1 did it. They never went back to this style, and for me, Rome 1 was where Total War peaked, mechanically at least holding itself up to being one of the greatest RTS games of all time. We got the most realistic simulation of 18th century warfare available to us. In Empire Total War, you're going to uh, use rank and file tactics. You got your musketeers, your militiamen, your cavalry. All that stuff is created on the campaign map. And then when two, ar two opposing armies meet each other, that's when you get into these real-time battles, ensuring that you have the best shot and maximum firepower for each of your volleys. If you're worried it's all about shooting and firing, don't be. There's also brutal and bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat. 2009 gave us the fifth installment of the Total War franchise, and this was Total War Empire. Bringing a completely new engine that was reworked for the series, it changed, well, a lot. The map was on another scale, being able to switch between North America, India, Europe, depending on the factions you're playing as, muskets being a massive part of it, and mostly down to the new engine, changing the way that the real-time battles occurred. Focusing on ranged combat, swift cavalry charges, and the biggest addition of gunpowder artillery. Seeing men flying as balls whacked into their behind like me on a Friday evening. Giving way to large ship battles and naval warfare, done like never before. Empire was incredibly revolutionary, and whilst it is famous for being the first total war that almost missed its mark in terms of its launch being incredibly buggy, it was nominated for a BAFTA Games Award for strategy at the time, and to this day is looked back as a beloved title, with incredible reviews on Steam, and despite its rocky start, is down with the classics of the historical Total Wars. It also gave way to a standalone expansion in Napoleon Total War, taking us to the golden age of musketry, fighting alongside or against Napoleon in his famous campaign in Egypt or across Europe. Being able to hide troops in buildings, set up guards and recreate the Battle of Waterloo like never before. And graphically, Napoleon touched it up a notch even further, taking advantage of this new engine that was really catered towards ranged combat. Something that perhaps might come to bite them in the future. This new engine, whilst overhauling the game for ranged combat and muskets, started to show its age or at least its limitations when it came to the original style. The things that made Total War famous in Rome or medieval, and it tended to not function at least as expected. I briefly touched upon the bugs that Empire launched with, and this came into fruition massively in Rome too. You know, we made a mistake, uh, and it was the studio that made the mistake, or uh, you know, I made that mistake. We decided to to go ahead and and launch that game, and it wasn't quite ready. And we knew we we weren't quite ready, but we thought it was going to be fine, and we would, you know, manage fine. And it was a real watershed moment when we realised we'd made a terrible mistake. This new Warscape engine was perfect for musket warfare, firing balls of lead into your enemy from an unsafe distance. Yeah, sure, Italian chef kiss to that. But as soon as enemies collide, as soon as enemies clash that's when the problems start to show. You see, this was hidden pretty well in Empire and Napoleon, just to the nature of bayoneting and cavalry charges not being the focus of the game. But bringing that back into Shogun 2, and more specifically, Rome 2, you saw the troops meld within each other. Enemies routing through your own forces, getting slaughtered time after time. AI running around in circles, not understanding how a game works, or even how a normal brain functions. The only thing that worked well? The ranged combat. Arrows sticking in the side of enemies looked beautiful, pinging off the walls of a city in a very satisfying way, so you could tell this is where the main issues lied. Of course, we can't blame everything on the Warscape engine, and it was later refined in subsequent Total War titles, but Rome 2 was such a disaster upon launch that I think that's where the love of CA started to dwindle. Are we trying to do a Madden now, Sega? Are you guys cracking the whip on Creative Assembly to crank these things out every two years, even though they tell you it's not enough time? Because so God help me, if that's what you're doing, I will come over there and I will bitch slap you! 
But despite their issues, Rome 2 and Attila, its later standalone expansion, became very successful. After numerous fixes and a lot of time for players to get used to the new style, these games, we didn't know it at the time, would be the last moment, the last hurrah of Total War as a franchise in its historical sense. Because it all started to change from that point. This is where fantasy came into the franchise, starting with Warhammer. Okay, I have skated past Thrones of Britannia, and it does exist in some people's eyes, but in a similar way that logic exists to Flat Earthers, very lightly. In 2016, we got Total War Warhammer, releasing to major hype, and it was so beloved. Seeing fantasy in Total War at the time was something I don't think anybody expected, and I adored it. Having flying beasts, magic spells, that first trailer of seeing the Empire and Cal Franz defending it against the orcish hordes, I think showed people a new side to what Creative Assembly could do. Not only this, but it was an incredible success, bringing in a mass amount of new players, having a new campaign map with all new factions based on an already established IP that has been beloved for decades, having things like underworld battles with dwarves, or being able to hunt down and eat men as orcs to sustain your horde. The amount of new mechanics that Total War Warhammer brought in was never ending. And Creative Assembly saw this, it saw the millions of copies sold, it saw the beloved reviews, and it saw a future within Warhammer and the fantasy in general. So this is where we got Warhammer 2, much more of the same thing but adding in different factions like the Skavens, High Elves and Lizard Kings, beautifully done and very well loved. Free for all battles that were strangely enough missing within the first Total War Warhammer. The fantasy train was speeding along the rails and everybody thought this was it. This was where Total War was ramping up for a new historical game that was going to use the budget and the skills, the massive advancements and the scale that the Creative Assembly team had grown to and it was going to implement it within historical Total War. So may I present to you three kingdoms. I think with Warhammer, I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of our core historical fans came with us, uh, you know, on the uh, on the Warhammer adventure. So uh, uh, you know, we can see that a lot of the players who, who played the historical games also play Warhammer. I think we were aware of that, that that whenever we're making a historical game after Warhammer, you know, you can't ignore the fact that that game exists and it has dragons and and fiery things all over the place. And um, and if we're not careful, we end up making the historical games look a bit dull by comparison. I think this is where the main issues started with the divide between fantasy and historical fans, because they should be the same people. Yet Creative Assembly decided to go down this route. Saying that they thought history would be boring after fantasy doesn't entirely make that much sense, since yes, there is a mix between the fan bases, but nobody complained about history beforehand. People actually adored it, and still to this day look back at the old historical games as the best Total War titles, so that never really tracked with me. Personally, I think Three Kingdoms is a very solid game, and it really takes Total War to the modern day with its campaign, and I adore its historical modes. The romance was a sort of in-between section though, and this we saw later and later on. Total War never really went back to true history, but in set from Warhammer 3, they never went back to true fantasy either. They got stuck in this middle ground where they didn't please the historical fans because, well, there was beasts and mythological creatures, and they didn't please the fantasy fans because it was stuff that was still limited by the basic history they decided to use. This started in Three Kingdoms, but made a bigger display within Troy, having this what if mythological creatures were real, and deciding their own way of interpreting it. Later on, they did add the Mythos DLC, going full fantasy and having a full historical version of Troy, and I actually think Troy as a game is severely underrated. Its campaign looks beautiful, and it does have some dodgy AI, and its initial launch was a disaster with epic games, yet the game itself is very solid, but it's Total War's indecisiveness that is the biggest issue with the franchise at the moment. I think since Attila, it has never been the same for history fans. I think since Warhammer 2, it's never quite been the same for fantasy fans. With Three Kingdoms and Troy being a middle ground between the two, they never really captured people the same way that other titles did. So for me, it really was Attila, the day where historical Total War died. The last video saying you were quitting Total War and stuff, what was there like a catalyst that because obviously it sounds like it was building up for a while but what was the catalyst for that 
Well, yeah, it was Troy. Troy Total War, okay. which I don't know if you remember that game. You know, a lot of times these games, they come Look, out I've, and they're I'm a forgotten. Pretty, I'm a bit of a veteran on that. I've got 40 minutes in that. So. Oh, 40 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, let's see what Three Kingdoms is about. And then they released it and I was like, okay, I'm getting real nervous. I'm getting real nervous because uh, I played Dynasty Warriors mm -hmm. and that ain't, that ain't that is not history. Let's wait though because they were trying to make both sides happy. I think that was a stupid move. I think they need to just yeah. make it very strict history, very strict fantasy. Whilst I personally think Attila was the last hurrah for historical total war, at least in the way that everybody loves it, they had some massive success with the Warhammer titles which grew the fan base tenfold and of course brought a lot of love to CA much deservedly. But after Three Kingdoms, Troy and well of course Thrones of Britannia was mixed around somewhere there, people started to fall off the franchise a little bit. Especially online, the talk was becoming more negative than positive for Total War. And that's where we sit now. A community divided, decided between historical and fantasy. When I think actually most people enjoy both, they just want both to be done properly, not half arsed between either. Which looks like the future. You see, Pharaoh was announced a few months ago now, and at first people were skeptical, mostly because it was made by the Sophia team, the guys that made Troy, and well, because it looks a lot like Troy. It did also seem like it's a repackaged Total War Sagas game, since Pharaoh didn't seem at first to be big enough to be a mainline Total War, but I think Sagas have been chucked off the rails now, and we are now going back full steam ahead with one mainline series. But Pharaoh does have some potential, and I am actually incredibly optimistic. Some of the mechanics that they've been bringing into the campaign are, well, old, but stuff that haven't been in the Total War franchise for a long, long time, and I'm very glad that they're starting to bring back. Battle mechanics like being able to retreat men or slowly shift forwards or backwards is a really nice touch. The battles themselves do look more like Troy, but we seem to slightly be hinting back to those old Rome to Attila days in terms of the aesthetic, which is definitely a positive for me. And the other thing, they have mentioned that Pharaoh is going to be 100% historically accurate. They are not branching into fantasy whatsoever, which if they keep to that promise, I am very optimistic that this could be not necessarily a comeback for the Total War franchise, but at least the first step to regaining that trust by the fan base. Because for me, the Total War games were always something that I could reliably have a lot of fun with, but the last few, I maybe get 10 hours maximum. Not like Rome 2 that I have hundreds of hours in, or even Rome 1, which I don't even want to have a look at how many hours I have in that game. But those kind of games seem so few and far between, so I really hope that Pharaoh is a step in the right direction. Because yes, Attila for me was the day historical Total War died, but maybe Pharaoh is the day it was revived.